Will you take your copy of the scripture and turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. That will be our passage this morning. And as you're turning there, I do have some sad news uh, for some of you. You may or may not have seen in the news a couple of months ago, but the thimble in the game of Monopoly is no more. It is gone. The thimble is gone. It's no longer one of the tokens that you can use as you play that game. In fact, not only is the thimble gone, but so is the old boot and the wheelbarrow. They are gone. And this is not, these are not the first tokens that have disappeared from the game of Monopoly over the years. Parker Brothers, who produces this game, has removed tokens uh, from time to time. In fact, the tokens that I grew up playing Monopoly with are not the tokens that are in the box that my kids have today. They are uh, a little bit different. Uh, what Parker Brothers tries to do is they try to evaluate their tokens to see which ones are too old-fashioned for today's use. They wouldn't connect with the culture. And so after having an online poll in which there were, I think, about 63 or 65 different token options, uh, the thimble and the boot and the wheelbarrow didn't make it. So what's going to replace those? Well, there's going to be a Tyrannosaurus Rex, there's going to be a rubber duck, and a penguin. Those are the new tokens that are coming and only time will tell how long the few remaining original pieces will last. But you know, sadly, there are people within the church who take a similar approach. They're looking for all the old-fashioned things that need to be retired. Now certainly, we need to evaluate from time to time the things that, that make up a worship service or, or something like that to look to see what was culturally added for that time or that era, uh, things that can be adjusted. But so often the things that are seen as old-fashioned and in need of retirement are those things that are core to the gospel. And, and, and that's things such as the, uh, our status as sinners in need of grace, uh, the exclusivity of Jesus as the way of salvation, the necessity of our sanctification. They're considered out of date by our current culture. And so many churches, entire denominations even, have decided to remove these. But unlike thimbles and wheelbarrows, the gospel is never up for replacement just because it is no longer popular in our society and in our culture. So this morning, as we study 1 Thessalonians 2.13, we'll see that the gospel remains as effective today as it did in the time of Paul when he was preaching it to the Thessalonians. And as we examine this verse this morning, we'll see two aspects of the effective gospel. We'll see its power and its reception. So will you stand with me in the honor of the reading of God's word the Apostle Paul wrote to the Thessalonians in verse 13, And we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the faithful men and women who shared it with us. And when we heard it, we recognized it as the word of God and not the word of man, just as the Thessalonian believers did. Father, as we study the gospel this morning and think about its implications for our life, its power and, and its reception, I pray that you reignite in us that passion that we are to have for your word and for the gospel, not only in how it applies to us, but how we are to proclaim it as well. We ask all of this in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. Now, if you are a believer here with us this morning, I want you to understand that you have but one message. You have a singular message message. 
to declare to this world, and that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. You don't have anything else. Now, what, where we err, where we get off track, is when we start to think that our message needs to change with the times or that we need to adorn that message with any number of ornaments to make it more palatable to people today or, or by extension, to remove things from it. And it's easy to go down that path because we're constantly being bombarded today by experts who tell us that the gospel is in need of a facelift, the gospel is in need of a makeover so that it can be relevant to the culture today, that we need to get away from that old-fashioned stuff. But the truth is that the gospel is as powerful today as it has always been. It has not lost one iota of power or effectiveness just because the culture around it has changed. Now, we can be dismayed sometimes when we hear our culture uh, question even the very foundations of truth, and especially the truth claims that come in Scripture. But really, this isn't any different from what people have done throughout the entire history of humanity. Think of Pontius Pilate as he was questioning Jesus. What did he say? What is truth? See, even, even Pontius Pilate could have fit in very well in our postmodern culture today. Uh, go back even to the Garden of Eden and, and the serpent who said, Did God really say? Questioning the veracity of truth. We see that. But when the gospel is faithfully proclaimed by God's redeemed, just as it was by Paul, Silas, and Timothy in Thessalonica, then we see its power on full display when it is presented in its fullness and in its richness. You see, when it's presented as such, people see it and they hear it and they receive it as the word of God, not as the word of men. And they're only able to recognize it as such because of the power that the full gospel contains. And so let's examine what the power of the gospel is. The first thing that we see is that the gospel is living. Throughout the word of God, we see that the, that the word is living and active. It is not a dead letter that was written thousands of years ago to some ancient people who are no longer around and has no application or purpose for us today. No, the Word of God is living. It is not simply a collection of wise sayings. Now, it certainly contains wisdom that is far and, and above anything this world has to offer. It's not just a collection or a guidebook for living a good life, although there's no way to live a good life apart from it. And it's certainly not simply a collection of stories and fables that are intended to teach some kind of moral lesson, although you cannot have true morality apart from it. No, all those things characterize any number of other writings produced by men, but the gospel and the Word of God is so much more. The gospel <clears throat> excuse me, is complete and it is effective because it is a living, it is, it is alive. And we can see that it is alive because no matter what people have tried to do to destroy it, to remove it, to get rid of it, it remains. And it not only remains, it grows. Have you, have you noticed that? I, now, I know that there are some who would say, listen, people have, have tried to ban other religious texts, things like the Quran or things like the uh, Bhagavad Gita, things like that. They, they've tried to do that, sure, but no other religious text has received as varied, as constant, and as consistent uh, uh, an attempt to destroy it than the Bible. It, is, it stands alone in that respect, and it stands alone in that respect because it is the living word of God. If the gospel were indeed the word of men, as Paul said it was not, but if it were the word of men, I assure you, we wouldn't be sitting here today, and we would not have this document in front of us 
It would be considered just something very old and very out of date. But the Word of God is alive. And the Word of God not only has endured every attempt to destroy it, it has spoken to people across time and culture. It doesn't matter if you're an Ethiopian eunuch in the first century. It doesn't matter if you're Irish pagans in the seventh century. It doesn't matter if you're Indian Hindus in the 18th century, and it doesn't matter if you're Americans in the 21st century. The gospel speaks to us. The gospel tells us what our condition is, and it tells us what we need to hear. It is relevant because the human condition has not changed. We are all still sinners in need of a Savior. We are all still in need of God's unmerited grace. And so when we proclaim the gospel, just as Paul did to the Thessalonians, we proclaim an effective message because it is alive. But second, I want you to see that the gospel also produces faith. Now when the word of God is at work in a person, just as it was in these Thessalonian believers, it produces the faith that is necessary for us to believe this message. I want you to think about Adam and Eve in the garden when they sinned and they rebelled against God. God warned them what the consequence for eating the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was, didn't he? He said, if you eat of it, you will surely die. Now, that didn't mean simply a physical death, although that was certainly part of it. God meant that they would experience spiritual death as a result of their sin. And that's what Paul tells us, that we are dead in our sin. You see, each one of us has inherited that spiritual death from our forefather, Adam. We've received it. It's been passed down generation to generation. You have it. I have it. We were all spiritually dead apart from Christ. We were dead in our sins. What we were not, we were not sick. We weren't just really bad off. We weren't mostly dead. We weren't almost dead. We don't have provenient grace that gives us just enough to hear and respond. No, we're dead. We're dead in our trespasses. But the power of the living gospel is this, that the Holy Spirit breathes life into us and regenerates our hearts through the gospel message when it's proclaimed. That's the wonderful thing. Paul said in Ephesians 2.8, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. You see, every single aspect of our salvation, every bit of it from start to finish, is the work of God. Every bit of it. Not you, not me. We don't, we don't do anything for it. It's none of our own doing. I love the way that, that Jonathan Edwards phrased it. He said, the only thing you contributed to your salvation is the sin that necessitated it. That's all that we have done. All right? And so, so God has done the salvation for us. And when we share the gospel with others, it is the means through which God has ordained that the Holy Spirit would work to produce the faith necessary to receive it. So when we proclaim the gospel, we proclaim an effective message because it produces faith in its hearers. But third, I want you to see that the gospel is the power to save. Have you considered the lineage of faith that you and I stand in today? Have you ever stopped to really think back of the faith of those who came before us? Abel, who offered a sacrifice that was pleasing to God, Noah, whose faith was the only righteousness to be found on the entire earth. Abraham, whose faith was counted as righteousness. Elijah, whose, whose faith led him to stand on top of Mount Carmel against 450 prophets of Baal and, and, and stand firm. Or, or any of the prophets throughout the Old Testament. Or the apostles who were transformed because of their faith 
from cowardly people hiding in a locked room after Jesus had been crucified to people who stood in the temple portico proclaiming that Jesus was the Messiah, even though the authorities said, if you do this again, we'll kill you. They said, whether to listen to you or listen to God, we're going to choose God, and we're going to proclaim the gospel. And that's just the people in Scripture. There's another 2,000 years of faithfulness that we could spend all day talking about. You see, the same faith that saved each one of those individuals is the faith that saved you and me. It is faith by which we are saved. But we need to be clear, right? The gospel is very clear. It is not a generic faith. It is not simply believing that God exists that saves you. It's not simply believing that Jesus was a real person who walked on earth at one point and who was a good teacher. We don't see any of that. That's not the kind of faith that saves. The faith that saves is the faith that is in the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that you must be born again. You know, that's a phrase Going back to that idea that the old-fashioned stuff needs to go away, you don't hear that as much in the church, do you? That you must be born again. But Jesus said it. That's what we must be. We shouldn't be ashamed to tell people that we are born-again believers in Jesus Christ. That's it. You see, unless you are born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. You must be born again. You must have that regenerated heart. And praise Him. He provides the way for us to be born again. He provides us with the power to be saved through the effectual gospel call that regenerates a person's heart and gives them the faith to believe and to profess with their mouths that Jesus is Lord and believe in their heart that God raised Him from the dead and repent of their sinful lifestyles and turn to God. That is what the message of the gospel does. It's the power to save. So when we proclaim the gospel, we proclaim an effective message because it is the power of God to save. The fourth thing I want you to see this morning is that the gospel produces spiritual growth or what we call sanctification. Now, I have heard from time to time believers say something like, you know, the gospel is a one-time event in a believer's life. You hear the gospel, you respond to the gospel, you believe in Jesus, you're saved, great. But you don't need to worry about the gospel anymore. I've even heard some who say, boy, I, I wish you wouldn't preach so much about the gospel and get into the other stuff. The gospel permeates the words of Scripture from Genesis to Revelation. The gospel permeates every word that's in here that is it. You see, what happens sometimes is that believers start to think that it's their own effort at living obediently and, and holy, uh, that holy life, that their efforts are what's pleasing to God and their sanctification. But that surprises me because it fails to understand what the role of the gospel is in our sanctification. You see, each of us must be living every day in the shed blood and the righteousness of Jesus Christ. There is no other way to live. The only performance that matters to God is that which is done in Christ. Listen to the way Peter puts it in 1 Peter 2, 4, and 5. He said, As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. That is the only way that your effort and my effort can be found acceptable to God. That's it. Paul did not think that it was his effort no matter how much he traveled, no matter how much he proclaimed the gospel to people who had not heard it, he didn't think that any of that mattered if it was not being done in Christ. That is all that mattered to him. And so you and I, brothers and sisters, we must hear the gospel every day of our lives because it is the gospel that continues to remind us that our day-to-day -day acceptance by the Father is, 
is not based on what we do for God, but upon what Christ did for us. That is it. Now, we do not, when we do not preach the gospel to ourselves, when we're not preaching it to us and, and allowing the gospel to work through us, remember that Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, Lord, sanctify them in the truth. And what is the truth? Your word. Your word is the truth. The gospel is the truth. Be sanctified through it. Allow the Holy Spirit to apply the gospel in our life. We have to remember that our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. That's it. That's it. And so when we return daily to the gospel, we're reminded of how great our salvation is. We're reminded that God did it all. He did every bit of it, and he continues to do every bit of it. And he who began a good work in you will be faithful to see that it is completed on that day. That's the gospel. And that's what is at work in you believers. That's how Paul ended this verse. It's at work in you believers. So when we proclaim the gospel, we proclaim an effective message because it sanctifies those it saves. The last thing that I want us to consider about the power of the gospel this morning is that it defeats our enemy. You see, because of the gospel, what Christ has done for us, Satan is a defeated foe. And we saw that defeat all the way back in Genesis 3.15, the very first mention of the gospel. And it was God himself who said, speaking that curse on the old serpent, he said, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. But just because Satan is a defeated foe doesn't mean that he is not a dangerous foe. He remains dangerous today. Now, here in Michigan, out of the, I believe it's uh, 20 different species of snakes that are native to our area, there is only one that is venomous, and that's the eastern uh, Massasauga rattlesnake. That's it, and it's not even really common around here, right? We don't see it very much, but it's it. Where I come from in northeast Georgia, however, we have three different types of rattlesnakes, plus copperheads, water moccasins, and coral snakes. So you learn that you have to be careful when you are out and about because we've got 40 different species of native snakes and, and a lot of them are, are venomous. Whenever we would come across a venomous snake while we were out, usually we would kill it. And the reason is because of the danger that it posed. And usually when you killed the snake, you usually had a hoe or a shovel or something that you could use that at a distance chop its head off. And when you decapitate a snake, I'd call that a defeated snake, wouldn't you? If that snake doesn't have its head, it's defeated. It's, it's done. However, you learn very quick that you still don't go anywhere near the head for a long time, even though it's been defeated. Because that head can still bite you and can still inject venom in you hours after it has been removed from the body. In fact, I was just reading this week about a Chinese chef in China who was making a delicacy, a cobra soup. And of course, you know, cobra soup is only good if you have fresh cobra. That's, that's the only way that you can palate it. And, and he removed the head of the cobra, and he set it aside, and he was working and wasn't paying any attention, and 40 minutes later, got his hand near the head, bit him, and he died. See, Satan has really been decapitated. The work of Christ on the cross defeated him. It bruised his head. Uh, some translations have it crushed the head. When your head is crushed, you don't really survive that, do you? No. He's defeated. However, he is still dangerous. And it just saddens me greatly that some believers think that Satan's defeat is equal to his ineffectiveness. And so they start cozying up to sin, thinking that the temptation will never get to them. 
That's what they think. But here's another reason why we need to preach the gospel to ourselves every day and why we need to hear it constantly when we gather together as the body of Christ. The gospel reminds us of the gravity of our sin and of the danger of Satan. That so His, his danger was so great, the death that, that came from sin is so terrible that it required God to send his son, Jesus Christ, to defeat it, to live the perfect life that you and I could not, to be that perfect sacrifice that we could not offer, and to rise again to defeat death all on our behalf. So when we proclaim the gospel, we proclaim an effective message because of the victory that we have in Jesus Christ. Now, Paul and Silas and Timothy were certainly proclaimers of this powerful gospel uh, while they were in Thessalonica as well as all the other places they traveled. And they may have adopted their method when they traveled around, how they presented, but the message itself never changed. They never diluted the gospel. They never watered it down in order to make it more palatable to the Athenians more than it would have been to the Bereans or, or to the people in Antioch or, or wherever that may have been. No, they always preached the full gospel because they understood that the power of the gospel lay in presenting it in its entirety. And since the power of the gospel is the power of God, who were they and, and who are we to try to change that message? Who do we think we are that we think we're smarter than God and that the message can be changed and adapted based on how we evaluate things? No, we need to take the message that God has given us and understand that it is relevant for all people in all times because it speaks to all people in their condition as sinners. That's it. But we have changed it. We've made it more relevant. We've, we've jettisoned parts of it like your sinfulness or the exclusivity of Christ. And sure enough, if you preach that gospel, which Paul would say is a different gospel, you, you'll get people to come to the church. You'll get people to show up because it feels good, but they won't stay. And you'll wonder why people are leaving the church. You'll wonder why the younger generations don't stay because they don't have the gospel. They don't have the thing that gives them the power to stand firm. You see, an easy believism gospel is a different gospel, and it's not one that leads to faith and salvation. It's one that leads to hell. We have to be so cautious to protect the gospel message in its entirety because when the gospel message is proclaimed in its fullness, it is received as the word of God. So let's look at how the reception of the gospel occurs well, first of all, the gospel is to be received in faith. Now, I am thankful for the incredible ministries that we have today, the apologetic ministries that we see. People like uh, Ravi Zacharias or Josh McDowell or Lee Strobel, or if you want to go back a little bit in time, people like Cornelius Van Til. Uh, in his presuppositional apologetics. Fantastic men and, and women who have been used by God in their gifts, in their intellectual gifts, to equip the church to engage in the culture, to have a, a reasoned defense for the hope that we have. And those are good things. I encourage you to study that, to be trained in, in how to engage. But I want you to know that it doesn't matter how good or how rational or how logical or how point A, B, C, D your argument is, that alone will not convince anyone of the truthfulness of the gospel. Because the truthfulness of the gospel is a spiritual truth. And as a spiritual truth, it can only be understood and received by the power of the Spirit working in the life of the hearer. Now, that's not to say that we should not be uh, studying to learn how to engage people and how to have these conversations by all means. I, I, listen, I believe that the evidence for the gospel is greater than it is for anything else. We have more evidence for Jesus Christ and what he did for us than we have for Julius Caesar having lived. Did you know that? We have more evidence. But the evidence alone is not what's going to convince people. The evidence, if you don't believe me, 
Look at all the people who still believe that the earth is flat, despite the evidence, despite the pictures, despite all of that. There are still people who hold very strongly to that. So the evidence itself is not going to convince them, but God can use it. God can use those tools in our toolbox through the power of the Spirit to get people to hear and to receive His Word, His Gospel. But next, notice the Gospel is to be received in humility. You know, Paul, Silas, and and Timothy, they were proclaiming this message from God to the Thessalonians. I'm pretty sure, based on how Paul describes this in verse 13, he says, you know, that, that when you receive the Word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the Word of men, but as it really is, the Word of God, which is at work in you believers. I don't believe that the Thessalonian believers responded the way that many Americans do today to the gospel. When you tell someone God loves you, it's, well, of course he does. I'm awesome, right? You know, I, I'm the coolest cat around. Why wouldn't God love me? That's the nature that we have today, the pride that is there. You know, there's always been a rejection of the gospel among people because of its apparent unfairness. Have you ever heard anybody say that the gospel is unfair, that that if God was really good, that if God was really loving, he'd just save everybody, that he wouldn't let everybody go, anybody go to hell. I think we're seeing an increase in that mentality today. We've, We've seen it throughout history, but I think we're seeing an increase of it. And I think the reason we're seeing the increase of it is because we've watered down the gospel so much that we have removed the reason for the gospel in the first place, our sinfulness. We've made people out to be basically good. I, Lifeway Research has done this. They've, they've polled uh, people who belong to evangelical churches like this one, and they've asked them, what is your view on human nature? And did you know that the majority of people, and I'm talking Christians, not Secular people, Christians, the majority say people are basically good. People are basically good. You can't find that in Scripture. It's not there. It is as if we have adopted the motto of the Masonic Lodge. Do you know what that is? We take good men and make them better. That seems to be what the church tries to be today. The message of the gospel is something else. The message of the gospel is the God takes depraved wretches and he makes them perfect in the work of Jesus Christ. That's it. That's a little different, isn't it? It's a different message. A watered-down gospel has no convicting power because it has removed the horrific nature of our sin. It turns us into basically good people who just need a little help. We just need a little nudge in the right direction. Brothers and sisters, let us resolve this morning to never soften the message of the gospel, to never give the impression that we might approach God with any sense of pride in our life that we're doing Him a favor coming to Him. No, let us approach the gospel in humility, thanking God for all that He has done for us even when we weren't deserving of it, even when we weren't capable of doing it. But third, the gospel is to be received with desire. Now, I have seen a lot of strange and wonderful things in my life, but what I have never seen is somebody who presented with the gospel and with a regenerated heart hears that message and says, eh, whatever. Uh, Yeah, I'll give Jesus a shot. You know, maybe it'll work and maybe it doesn't. And if it doesn't, you know, I'm not out anything, right? Have you ever heard anybody respond to the gospel that way? No, they don't respond to the... If if the Holy Spirit has regenerated their heart, if there's true conversion coming, they receive the gospel with desire. They have an overwhelming desire to have Jesus no matter what the cost. Those who hear the gospel and are drawn to it, want Jesus above all else. They'll get rid of anything else to have Jesus. Do you remember that moment in your own life? Do you remember that moment when you 
came face to face with Christ and God worked in your heart to call you to himself? Do you remember that desire that you had for him? I hope it's still your desire. I hope that the desire of your heart today is still to have Jesus above all else, to be united with him in salvation. We'll see a desire in our hearts to want to please him, to live lives that are holy and obedient to him. But sometimes in our evangelism, we can get, oh, we can get excited. We want to almost pressure people into receiving the gospel, right? We want them to receive it. And so we, we pressure them to make a decision or to pray a prayer. And, and sometimes they do. And you know why? They do it so that we'll leave them alone because we're pressuring them too heavily. But if there is no desire for Christ and for more of the gospel in the person, then there was no conversion. When a person is transformed by the gospel, there's a desire for the gospel. Now, the gospel must also be received with application. To receive the gospel without doing the gospel is not to receive the gospel in the first place. That's why James said, faith without works is dead. It's not your works that save you. It's not your works that contribute to salvation. Your works are the evidence of salvation. So if you are out there and you say, oh, yes, I follow Jesus, where's your fruit? What are you producing? You'll know a tree by the fruit. You see, to hear and study the Word of God without applying it in our lives only results in a head knowledge. And a head knowledge puffs up. A head knowledge makes you proud and arrogant. You know, it's a good thing to know about God. And, and there are times when we can learn from other godly people who have written on that subject. If you've even peeked into my office at any time, you probably have picked up on the fact that I read a, an awful lot. I read a lot of books. They're good. But if I were to ever make the books the thing that I studied the most or the thing that I was more engrossed in than the Scriptures, then I would be an arrogant man. And the church and the world already has too many of them. We need to be in the Gospel. We need to be in the Word of God above and beyond all else so that we can see what it has to say to us today and apply it in our lives so that we can live it out. We need to listen to what the Holy Spirit has to say to correct the sinful behavior in us and to encourage us to live in a holy obedience to the commands of Christ. So at times, the gospel is going to be like a healing balm to our broken spirits. And other times, the gospel is going to be killing sin in us. And that can be painful sometimes. Thankfully, it does both. And just as the Thessalonians had demonstrated, the gospel must be at work in us. That's it. But the only way that can happen is if we're in the gospel. Now, finally, the last thing I want you to see this morning. We see that the gospel is to be received with replication. Brothers and sisters, you were not entrusted with the gospel for it to end with you. It doesn't end with you. You're supposed to share it. You're supposed to tell others about Jesus wherever you go. Each and every believer was given a great commission by Jesus Christ to go and make disciples. And do you know what the first step in making disciples is? Telling them about Jesus. Sharing the gospel with them. You cannot make a disciple out of someone who is lost. And someone is lost until they hear the gospel and respond in faith. So we must be doing this. We must be sharing it. Uh, Paul and, and Silas and Timothy, they were sharing the gospel wherever they went throughout the Mediterranean world, and wherever we go, we need to be sharing it as well. But, but I know sometimes Christians will say, but I get nervous when I speak about my faith. I'm nervous about telling others about Jesus. Why? Why are you nervous? I'll tell you ultimately what it comes down to. You're nervous about telling others about Jesus because you're worried about what that person's going to think of you. 
They're going to think that you're a religious kook, that you're a nut, that you're crazy. But the reality is that that's our pride getting in the way of our obedience. So this morning, I encourage you to repent of that pride. Commit yourself to being a gospel proclaimer. But other times, Christians will say, what if I say the wrong thing? What if I don't have an answer to a question that somebody has? What if I say something wrong to them and, and they reject the gospel forever? Well, when I hear some, I, I've heard people say that, and I say, well, I didn't know that you had the power to thwart God's will in a believer's life. That's just amazing. I, I had no idea. No, the reality is God works through imperfect vessels who say the wrong things and don't have the right answers all the time. Do you know something? It is okay to tell somebody when you're witnessing to them that you don't know. If they ask you a question and you don't know the answer, please don't make it up. Please don't try to create something to make yourself sound like you are the best and smartest person out there. Say, I don't know, but don't leave it there. Go and find the answer. Search it out in scriptures. Talk to your friends and your fellow believers. Come and talk to your pastor. That's fine too. Not that I have all the answers, but I know where to go to get them. And we can go there together and we can find it. You see, I can go through all the excuses for why we don't share the gospel with other people, but ultimately, it comes down to this. I want to ask you this question this morning. Do you believe that the gospel is effective? Is the gospel effective? That's the question that you have to answer. If you're not sharing it with people, it's because you don't believe it's effective. You don't believe that it will do what it says it will do, just as we saw this morning in our call to worship, that God's word will accomplish everything that it sets out to do. It does not return void. That's it. That's it. The word, the gospel, is mighty to save. So this morning, will you pray and repent of any pride or any doubt or any obstacle that's blocking you from sharing the gospel with those around you who need to hear it? This morning, uh, as the as praise team comes up after we pray, I... I invite you to come to the altar and pray. I'll pray with you. If you want to talk to me after the service, we can do that. If you want to do it right there in your seat, you can do that. But let's pray. Father, thank you for your gospel message. Thank you, Lord, that you sent your son Jesus to die for us even while we were yet sinners, even while we were still your enemies and children of wrath, you sent Christ to die for us. Thank you. Father, I praise you this morning that you have entrusted to us this message of the gospel to share with others. This is your plan. It isn't a fallback. It isn't plan B. This was plan A from before the creation of the world so that your glory might be demonstrated. Father, I pray that you ignite in our hearts that, that passion for telling others about you and what you have done for us. We know, we who have been saved, know how effective the gospel is. Father, keep us from trying to put it under a bushel barrel and hide it from the world. Let us... Proclaim it boldly and graciously and thankfully so that you can work through us. Your Holy Spirit can work through the proclamation of the gospel to draw all of your redeemed to yourself. Father, we look forward to that day when this age is done when we are gathered before the throne worshiping you with all of those who heard the gospel and responded in faith, singing a new song and praising you 
for all of eternity. So, Father, this morning, if there's anyone here who needs to come and do business with you, I pray that they do not hold back for fear of what someone might think, that they come and they pray. Father, if there's anyone here especially who does not know you as Savior, they've heard the gospel this morning. Father, I pray that you draw them to yourself and that you don't allow them to leave here without speaking to someone about what it means to trust in Jesus. And Father, we will rejoice over that lost sheep with all of heaven. It's in your powerful and mighty name we pray. Amen.